Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. How's everyone doing today? Welcome to Black History Weekend. Church board and finance meeting. Our church board is meeting next Monday on February 12th at 7.30 p.m. Members are encouraged to attend and suggestions are welcome to be considered for the agenda. Email the GCA church at gcasda.org to get your comment on the agenda. Have you heard of connect groups? They're interest-based small groups that provide a fantastic way to connect with high school students through shared hobbies and passions. Our next connect group evening is on February 14th at 8 p.m. If you want to start a connect group, reach out to jwoods at gcasda.org. Academy Day service and concert. February 17th, we're excited to welcome visiting students here for Academy Days. We'll have our church service in the gym at 11 a.m., and our Magnify students will be performing in a concert at 6 o'clock p.m. on Saturday evening. Let's be extra welcoming to our potential new members. Now, today is a special day where we are celebrating Black History Month. Black History Month is observed each February in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom as a time of special awareness of African Americans' contributions to their nations throughout its history. It's, it is the brainchild of Carter G. Woodson, who was the first African American with slave parents to earn a PhD. Here at GCA, we are blessed to be a part of a vibrant and diverse community. This is a blessing because when we look around this room, we can see the creativity and love of God. One part of this community is being highlighted today, and we have chosen a theme that gives focus to our worship service. The theme is rooted. As students from the African diaspora, we are rooted in our heritage. Whether we haul from one, hail from one of the African, Caribbean, or North American countries, we share a similar origin story, and we know where we are headed as an, our ultimate destination. As the Bible states in Revelation 5 verse 9, every nation, kindred, and tongue will be in heaven. So we celebrate each person regardless of their country of origin. Above all, we are also rooted in Christ. Beyond our shared ancestry, we are rooted in our identity, which we find in God. The Bible states in Ephesians 3.17, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow into God's love and keep you strong. As long as we are rooted in God, we will continue to blossom into the people he wants us to be. So today, we invite you to stay rooted. Focus on him as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Happy Sabbath, and Pastor Josh has an announcement. Good morning, church. Um, speaking of rooted, uh, this is a, a, a great theme for this weekend, but it was also the theme for our Southern Union prayer conference that GCA participa participated in uh, just a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. Uh, we took... Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, like 45 uh, or 50 GCA students down to Camp Kalakwa, uh, and all the academies in the Southern Union joined together uh, for our prayer conference. It's an annual thing that we, we do down at Kalakwa, and it's always such a highlight uh, for our GCA students and for academy students in general. And there were three of our students, three of our GCA students, who answered the call to be rooted. And they decided to uh, commit their lives to Jesus through baptism. So I want to invite those candidates up and, and just have them share a little bit about what led to that decision. Um, we wanted to talk, bring them up today because they weren't here and their church family, uh, they were not able to, you guys were not able to witness their baptism. And so I just wanted to have them come up and share why they made this decision and uh, just celebrate that decision today. So would you guys introduce yourselves and just share a little bit about why you decided to be baptized? Hi, I'm Maddie, and um, I got baptized at the age of 12. And when I got baptized, I was looking for this automatic spiritual high. And when I didn't get that, my relationship with God drifted apart. And so... Um, ever since then, God has been knocking on my heart, and once I went to prayer conference, I thought that that was a great time to resubmit my life to Christ.
So my name is Kiara, and I got baptized when I was in second grade. And I knew what I was doing. Um, I wasn't too young to not comprehend what I was doing. But I just felt like I had kind of, I really drifted away from God. And I needed a new start with him. And this was like, you're going to do it again. And you're going to keep going. And you're going to succeed. And so I want just God to work through my life. Um, my name is Kat, and when I first got baptized, I was nine, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into, um, but over the past couple of years, I was like, Lord, make me a vessel. Make me a servant leader. That's what we learned at prayer conference, and my rebaptism is to signify that, that I'm becoming a servant leader for him. Great job. And the GCA Church has a few small gifts for you guys as you uh, continue, journey, continue your journey with Christ. And so I just want to have a quick prayer for these guys. Let's bow our heads as we pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for being an amazing God. You are our creator. You're our redeemer. And you are just such a, a wonderful wonderful, amazing God. And so we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise today for these young ladies. I'm so proud that in a world that says we can do whatever we want, when we want, on our own, we don't need nobody, they have decided to surrender to you. They have decided that they need you in this world. And Lord, I just pray that as they begin this journey in their relationship with you, uh, baptism is really just the starting point. It's not the finish line. I pray that you would just walk with them daily, that you would send your angels to protect them, that you would um, help them to be a vessel so that they can honor you and lift you up. And I pray all this in your name. And I also pray, Lord, that this church would be, continue to be an encouragement to them, that we would lift them up and we would encourage them and we would walk with them in their faith. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. celebrate with us as we do our flag processional. Starting off with our first country, the Bahamas, represented by Gabrielle Zami, consists of 700 tropical islands and over 2,000 rock formations. However, only around 30 of its islands are inhabited. It is also home to one of the largest underwater cave systems in the world. The next country is Barbados, and the flag is being carried by Jacob Henry. Roughly triangular in shape, the island measures 20 miles long and about 15 miles wide. Although it is small, it is also the most densely populated country in the Caribbean. The biggest cultural event of the year is the Crop Over Festival that includes a carnival and calypso music that is typical for the island. The next country is Bermuda, and the flag is being carried by Michael and Landon Holder. Since Bermuda is only 25 miles long and two miles wide at its widest point, you are never more than one mile walk to the pink sand beaches. Perhaps the biggest misconception about Bermuda is that it's part of the Caribbean and a stone's throw away from Jamaica. However, it's actually much further northeast and is over 750 miles away from the Bahamas. Canada, also known as the True North, is being represented by Brianne Spellin and Jordana Harris. Although being known for its cold weather, Canada has regular seasons and is home to some of the most breathtaking scenery. From the vast prairies to the mountain peaks, taking a drive across this country will open your eyes to the majestic power of God. The Dominican Republic, whose flag is being carried by Gerda Pierre and Rachel Ed, is a stunning Caribbean island of Hispaniola. Known for its beautiful beaches and landscapes, the DR is the second largest country in the Caribbean. In addition, the Dominican Republic is the only country in the world to have the Holy Bible on its national flag. Following the Dominican Republic, we have Grenada, represented by Christina Sargent and Sasha Elias. Because Grenada produces so many spices, it is also called the Land of Spice. One of the biggest spices exported from Grenada is nutmeg. If you look closely at the flag, nutmeg can be found on the left side. Guyana is being represented by Ariana Forrester and Adriel Lewis. According to the English Oxford Dictionary, Guyana means the land of many waters. This is evidently seen through Guyana's famer, Kyder Falls, which is the world's largest single drop waterfall. 
It is also the only South American country whose official language is English. Haiti, represented by Jonathan DeJust and Nick Lebrun, is a breathtaking country known for its lovely beaches and beautiful coastlines. Haiti is influenced by African, French, and West Indian customs. The official languages are Creole and French, which define these cultures. It is also the most mountainous country in the Caribbean. Jamaica is the next country, represented by Madison James, Austin Bowen, and Brent Mears. Jamaica is the largest English-speaking island in the Caribbean. However, the national language of Jamaica is Patois. Jamaica is famous for many things. One, for instance, is Jamaican food. Some of the national foods are ackee and saltfish, jerk chicken, curried goat, and oxtail. It is also home to one of the rarest coffees in the world. Following Jamaica, Jovan Ravoni Naribu represents our next country, Madagascar. Found 300 miles east of southern Africa, this country is home to some of the world's most unique flora and fauna. Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. In addition, it also has a youthful population with over 60% of its residents being under the age of 25. St. Lucia is represented today by Madison Sergeant James. This island is 27 miles long and was formed from volcanoes. The original main crop was sugarcane, but the island now produces a large amount of bananas. The people there speak French patois as they enjoy the crescent-shaped beaches, small fishing villages, rainforest reefs, waterfalls, and geothermal elements, which are just some of St. Lucia's many attractions. Trinidad and Tobago is represented by Arlisa Hart. Trinidad is the southernmost island country in the Caribbean. Well known for its African and Indian cultures, seen in their large and famous Carnival, Diwali, and Jose celebrations, as well as being the birthplace of Steel Pan and the Limbo. This diverse population is made up of different descents, have produced a culture filled with amazing food, diverse beliefs, and colorful festivals. Representing the United States of America is Jacob Miles and Elizabeth Scott. While some may say English or Spanish is the nation's official language, America actually doesn't have one. America is famous for its beautiful nature encounters such as the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone National Park, Mount Rushmore, and so much more. When it comes to food, America is a melting pot for various cultures. American cuisine has been influenced by Europeans, Native Americans, Africans, Asians, and more. Needless to say, the USA is exquisite in many ways. Next, we have Malia Edwards and Mariah Logan representing the U.S. Virgin Islands. The U.S. Virgin Islands consists of about 60 tropical islands, with a population of around 23,000 people. About 83% of the population are descendants of immigrants from the African continent. With year-round warm weather, these islands contain magnificent tropical environments. Our last country is Zambia, represented by Tamelo Mahangu. Zambia is located in southern Africa and is home for the famous Zambezi River, which is the fourth largest river in Africa. Zambia's national symbol is the African fish eagle, which represents freedom from oppression and the country's willingness to rise above struggles. Thank you for joining us. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> Thank you, children. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord. Amen. Y'all had y'all readies today. Hey, Jacob, how are you, son? If you all don't mind uh, singing with us this morning, lift every voice and sing. We will sing lustily.
seated. That was your warm up. Amen. We're warmed up. We're ready to get see some praises and some worship, right? Amen. Amen. Right? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. These are the days of Elijah. I invite you that if you know it, sing with us, worship with us, however that may look. You may stand still, raise your hands, stand up, sing, whatever that is. Give it unto him. The days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord and these are the days of your servant Moses righteousness be it restored God like Jehovah. How many of you know that there's no God like Jehovah? Can you tell the team? There's no God like Jehovah. 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 No God. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah.
when the altos come and sing, altos, when the tenors come and sing, when the sopranos, y'all better sing for Jesus. Hallelujah, salvation and glory. One more time. He is one. He is one. I promise that was the last time. He is one. He is one. Durful.
It is time for our children's story. And before we get there really quick, my family has a little tradition where before, before we pray each night, we'll go around, the, go around the circle and everybody has to say something they're thankful for. And we do three little rounds. We fall into our familiar, our familiar things we're thankful for. And so oftentimes we'll, we'll preempt the person. I'm like, you can't say this. You said that yesterday. Mine usually is community. I love this community. This is wonderful. I like that we do these things. It is, it's, it's a good group. We are blessed to be here. Uh, and one of the parts of our community is, I don't know, this school over yonder that we are working on that is fulfilling an evangelistic role that is one of the most effective forms of evangelism we have ever invented. And that school is full. And that is a beautiful thing. And there are people working and moving dirt and making mud and building a foundation for an expansion and this invites the community to take part. Uh, so the children are going to walk through the aisles, and they're going to collect the dollars. Also, little children, nothing offends an old person more than offering you money and you walking by. So, so children, walk, walk extra laps around. Walk extra laps around. And Brother Tamello is going to bring us a children's story today. Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Tamelo Mohango. I'm a senior at GCA. I'm going to be doing children's story today. So my story is about a parrot and a monkey. Once upon a time, in a land full of giggles and wonder, there was a mischievous little monkey named Charlie. Charlie loved to swing from the trees and eat bananas and play pranks on his animal friends. One sunny day, as he swung through the jungle, he stumbled upon a mysterious treasure chest hidden beneath a giant palm tree. Curiosity sparked in his mischievous eyes as he wondered what could be inside. With a mischievous grin, Charlie Preed opened the mischievous the treasure chest. But instead of shiny gold and jewels, he found something unexpected. It was a tiny, talking parrot named Polly. Polly fluttered out the chest and perched on, Polly, on Charlie's shoulder. Hello there, Charlie. I'm Polly, 
your new feathered friend, she squawked. I have a special message for you. Charlie's eyes widened with excitement. What's the message, Polly? He eagerly, he, he asked eagerly. Polly cleared her throat and said, Charlie, my dear friend, always remember that laughter is a gift from God. It brings joy and lightens our hearts. But it's also important to be kind and treat others with love and respect. Charlie scratched his head, pondering wise, pondering Polly's wise words. He realized that it was fun to play pranks and have a good laugh. It was equally important to be mindful of others, others' feelings, and be a friend to everyone. From that day on, Charlie became the mischievous monkey with a heart full of kindness. He used his pranks to bring smiles and laughter to his friends, but never at the expense of hurting anyone's feelings. And so Charlie and Polly continued their adventures in the jungle, spreading laughter, love, and reminding everyone about the importance of God's gift. Remember, my friends, laughter and kindness go hand in hand, just like Charlie and Polly. Who wants to pray? I guess I'll pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for everything. I lo- our church is so good. We should take care of it for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Today, the scripture reading will be from Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Take some time to flip to that page. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be all glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, it's now time for prayer. So uh, please bow your heads and close your eyes. Oh, and kneel as far as possible. <laughs> Dear Lord. I thank you for life, health, and strength, and thank you for bringing us all through another week of life. Please be with the speaker and everyone that is involved in the service. I pray for everyone that got sick this week, and I pray for a quick and easy recovery for all of them. I also would like to pray for um, safe travels for everyone that is going home for home leave. And in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Marvin G. Clark Sr. served as the associate pastor at the Burren Seventh-day Adventist Church and the lead pastor of Legacy Church in Atlanta, Georgia, on the Atlanta Burren campus. Pastor Clark has afforded the privilege of proclamation in many diverse and prestigious pulpits. His scholastic journey began at the Berman University, Oakwood College, and the University of Maryland. He was matriculated with a BA in theology and religion, marriage and family counseling and chaplaincy with crisis intervention and grief following trauma. Pastor Marvin G. Clark, Senior is an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for over two decades. 
Pastor Marvin G. Clark has been awarded and recognized by governments and organizations and community agencies for his outstanding activity and leadership in communities that he has served. Pastor Clark is married to the love of his life, the former Olivia A. Grant. Her ministry and mandate to please God is what led them together to join as one. Lady Olivia Clark is a woman of God with a heart of God. They are, blo they are both blessed with four beautiful children, Micaiah and Madison, and Miles and Marvin Jr. And Marvin Jr. Pastor and Miss Clark both deserve, desire for one thing, and that is to please God throughout the Holy Spirit. Pastor Marvin G. Clark's dictum in life is, what is impossible with man is possible with God. From the book of Luke chapter eight, 18, verse 27. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. I think it's fair that we can give another hearty amen to that choir for that ministry and song. It is definitely an exciting time, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to be here with you on this day and on this weekend. I must confess to you that I am really, really impressed with this entire weekend that has taken place. On yesterday, I felt very humbled with how your leadership embraced me and made sure that all my needs was met. And uh, every now and then, I have the privilege of sharing a good word, whether it's internationally or locally, but I don't always get a chance to be with my family. And so we have two older children, Makai and Madison, that you heard in the introduction. That was very well done, by the way. And we have two younger kids, uh, which is Miles and Marvin Jr. And uh, we decided to let the last be first. Instead of the first having MJ or having Marvin Jr., we made the last have Marvin Jr. And so throughout this service, like last night, if you hear a little two-year-old's voice, just uh, really excited to be in this church, that will be my son. And so my lovely wife is with me today. Uh, she's in the back with Mrs. Johnson. Uh, baby, could you just wave so the church can see that I am married and happily married? <laughs> Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. So that is my wife, Olivia, and our two children, Miles and MJ. And I got to tell you, because normally, Pastor, when I go to preach somewhere, I make sure I don't go on certain days. And believe it or not, normally this is one of those days I normally don't go anywhere to preach. And that's because it's Miles' birthday today. And so he is a whopping seven. And so we praise God for his birthday. And I want it to be known in that number of perfection, number seven, he has decided to come here and worship at this church on this campus. And so to God be the glory for that. Amen. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. I bring you greetings from the Atlanta Berean Church and the Legacy Church on the Berean campus down in Atlanta, Georgia. On our pastoral staff, I made sure that I shared with them that I was coming here and they said to send their greetings because we understand what you're doing here and we really salute all the efforts and energy and the perfection when it comes to providing a space and place for children to grow, for students to become better versions of themselves. And so we thank God for your ministry. We thank God for all that you do. The activities that have taken place for these past couple of days have really just been showcasing how awesome God is and how much you expect from your students and faculty. So I salute you all for that. I also want to just real quickly acknowledge and mention uh, one of your teachers here who is a very good friend of mine. Uh, that is Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Melissa Johnson. I knew, I knew somebody would hand clap over there for her. We praise God for her and this opportunity and your team for this invitation for me to be here, of course, with Chaplain Josh. We thank the Lord for you. I also want to give a shout out to your pastor, Pastor Smith, uh, who I think is the coolest pastor in town, okay? Uh, he is just all that and then some. I love everything about him. His, his spirit, and I'm going to say this word, please don't judge me, his spirit and swag is telling some of you guys will get that, but later on, some of y'all will Google that word, okay? Uh, but make sure you get the best version of that word swag. But we praise God for his ministry and all that he does. And then, of course, Principal Garapi. Uh, I mentioned him last night. I think that is just a genuine good guy. Um, and I believe he's probably here this morning. If we can just put our hands together for him as well. Yeah. 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 And so we bless God for all of you. Uh, the gentleman that was at the door when I first came in, I don't know his name, but make sure he's at the door all the time. He is a greeter, excellence. And so we praise God for our experience here, my family and I. 
Today, I will confess, I won't be before you too long. I don't believe that I have to be uh, <laughs> one of those preachers that preach for a long time for you to get the message. But if you don't say amen, did I say that? Yes, I did. If you don't say amen and let me know you get it, then it's going to make me preach a little longer. So if I end up preaching a little long, uh, you can do nothing but blame yourself. Amen. Hey, oh, praise the Lord for all of that. I get you. All right. If you have your Bibles with you on this morning, I'm going to invite you please to turn to a very familiar passage. It's Genesis 22, verses 1 through 13. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 13. And if you don't mind to let the preacher feel relatively comfortable, what we do back at my church is we like to stand on our feet in honor of God's word. We know that when we go into the courthouse, we stand in respect of the judge. And we, when we hear the national anthem, we stand. And so I think it's fitting that we stand in honor of God's word on this morning. And so this is what the word of God says to the people of God and those that are here at the CGA, as well as those maybe who's online. The Bible says this, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. The Bible says, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. The word says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, somebody say the third day. The Bible says on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the knife, and the two of them went on together. Verse 7 says, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Us teachers out there would say, that's a good question, son. Verse 8 says, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached that place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10 says, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Verse 13, our final verse for our Samonic spotlight on today of course, deeply rooted in the theme, rooted. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. For the next few moments under the guidance of the spirit. I want to preach and teach this afternoon with this sermonic thought in mind. It broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. It broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we take this moment seriously. Because we believe your spirit is in this place. We ask, O oh God, that on today, at this sacred hour, that you will show up between and betwixt each pew, 
that you'll knock on the heart. And as we celebrate this month of black history, as we consider the challenges, the triumphs, the trials, the predicaments, the problems, the past, let us see you first. Because we know in your presence, there's healing, there's victory, and there's transformation. Now, Holy Spirit, speak for your children are listening. Be the good shepherd, we pray today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, as I considered preparing for this time, I found myself reflecting on the theme that was given to me entitled rooted. For in that word rooted is a plethora of things to consider. Rooted would have us to consider the pain of the past. Rooted would have us to consider the challenges of the past. The word rooted takes us back in history and forces us to come to a reality of what has gone and yet what is still going on. But as I consider this word rooted, I understand that sometimes we can get lost in the past and not feel the need to press forward into the future, which begs this preacher to entertain that In the idea of rooted, I also find myself considering what Christ calls us to be rooted in. And it is here that I have succumbed to this reality that this word faith is important. Faith can be the vehicle that transitions us from where we are or were to where we need to be. Faith propels us to push forward beyond how you feel, what things look like, what you hear, or what you've been exposed to. Faith has a way of turning on the light in a room of darkness. Faith has a way of giving you a smile in the midst of pain. Faith can actually take you from one temperature of feeling down and out to a place of hope and peace and resolve. That word faith is a glorious word. And When I considered faith, I couldn't help myself, Pastor, to consider that some of us wrestle with our faith because every day we wake up, we don't see some things that make us feel like we can have faith. But I would like to suggest to you to entertain the words that we once heard from none other than Dr. Martin Luther King. It was him who said faith is taking the first step on the staircase that you don't even see. It's trusting in the unknown. It's believing beyond your comfort zone. And the Bible leads us to a passage where faith is being tested. The word of God says there's a man by the name of Abraham. And Abraham, I would like to say, is a cool, calm, collective fellow. Abraham was promised something early in the book of Genesis. And now he finds himself with a situation that's causing him to have faith. He has to be rooted. And his rootedness has to follow that word faith. The Bible tells us that sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. 
The word says in verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. I need you to understand, church, it is going down like four flat tires. For the Bible's making it clear that what's going on is some real drama. The Lord blessed Abraham with a son named Isaac. And I need you to come a little closer to the reality of that. Because when we see the name Isaac, it feels like we should stop right there. But if you are entertaining the Hebrew, you will realize that Isaac actually means Yitchek. And Yitchek actually means laughter. So in other words, God blessed Abraham and his wife Sarah with laughter. And now God is saying, I'm take that laughter away you got to understand in order to understand the context of the text that Abraham's son Isaac didn't just represent a son that gave laughter but he was also a son that would work in the field and so it was considered that if you lost your son you lost something valuable you lost money you lost potential power you lost the idea to have your child continue your name and so this idea of losing your son it broke Abraham it caused Abraham to question even the promises of God because I need you to understand today that the Bible declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That is not a text that is considered for one kind of person. It is for all humankind. We are all valuable under the sight of God. The Bible declares that Abraham, I don't know about you church, but Abraham has to be the real deal like Evander Holyfield. And the reason why I say that is, I don't know how that brother kept it together. You got to take your son, your only son, and I want you to understand according to the text that he did not go and see his wife. Let me try that over here. I, I, I want you to understand that Abraham was told to take your only son and offer him as a sacrifice and he did not go to his wife. Help me Holy Ghost. Because if he went to his wife, help me sweet Jesus, it probably wouldn't have went down the way it went down. I can see maybe my sister in yellow that his wife would have said, baby, <laughs> you must have lost your mind, but you're not taking my son and offer him at no sacrifice on no mountain that God had told you. So Abraham, don't miss this, has to have a made up mind. He has to know the value of his relationship between God and himself. He has to be rooted in the faith that he experienced way before this moment. He has to lean on his past that will fuel the power for his present circumstance. I'm coming somewhere. I'm going to get you. Don't worry. I promise you. Every now and then I enjoy reading good books to my son. And on this particular day, I was reading a book about some frogs, Morgan. And what I love about frogs is frogs are some interesting creatures. I can tell by your face you do not agree with me. Let me try over here. And so frogs are some interesting creatures. And what I love about this story is as I was reading it, it was telling us that frogs were hopping along in the woods one day. And it's kind of like out here in Georgia. There's woods everywhere. And as the frogs were hopping along, one frog accidentally jumped into a pit instead of jumping over the pit. And before you knew it, four other frogs jumped into the pit and followed that other frog. And so now you have four frogs in a pit and all the frogs went around the mouth of the pit and they were looking in the pit and they were trying to use that frog talk that none of us can speak and they were saying, just get up. And the frogs were jumping, jumping, hoping that they can jump out of the pit. And over some time, they realized that the frogs didn't look like they were going to make it. But there was one frog that kept on jumping. And an old frog came hobbling along and he was watching what was going along. And I praise God for old frogs. And I noticed the old frog looked in and as he was watching this one frog keep jumping, he noticed that after a while that frog jumped right out of the pit. 
And all the other frogs were amazed. They said, how did you jump out? How did you keep on jumping? Why didn't you give up? And this is what the old frog said. He said, you fools. That frog that jumped out was deaf. So the whole time you were saying, just give up. He was reading your frog lips and thought you were saying, just get up. And I'm trying to suggest to someone today that when you're rooted in Christ, sometimes you have to be deaf to what people are saying. Sometimes you have to act as if you don't hear them because if you follow everyone and not follow Christ, you won't end up like Abraham in the text. The Bible says Abraham is faithful because he doesn't wake up, don't miss this, in the afternoon like Marvin G. Clark would have made up. But the Bible said he got up early in the morning. The Bible says he got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey. And I don't want you to miss this because it's worth listening to. And he says he got his servants and his son Isaac. And the word says, don't miss this right here. He said, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. This was on the third day. He says to the servants, stay here. And I and the lad are going to go over yonder. We're going to worship. But then he says, we're going to come back to you. Listen to me. From Genesis 1 all the way to Genesis 22. Never in the history of God's word has anybody been raised from the dead. But Abraham believed he had so much faith. He was rooted in faith that he said, no matter what goes on, I know that God is going to resurrect my son because he promised me that my child will give me the history of generations to come. He believed in the impossible. He believed what didn't make sense. He trusted not so much his present circumstance, but his trust was leaning to what God gave him. The hope of his tomorrow. I want you to notice that something that really scratched me and caused me to ask the question. Notice that he brought two of the young lads with him and the donkey. And I asked myself the question right there, Dr. Johnson, why is it that he brought two of the lads and the donkey? And here it is. Deep down, as good as Abraham looks, he was actually hoping and wishing that somehow God would have taken the two sons, the two lads, and left his boy alone. He was hoping that maybe God would take the two boys and the donkey and, and, and not take his son. But he realized he came to himself. He had a moment. He had a light bulb situation that came on and said, let me not try to play with God anymore. Because if God says something, you got to be obedient to it. And the Bible says that he, he, he tells them, you stay here because we're going to go worship. And the question could be asked, if you're a reader like me that asks questions when I'm reading, why is it that he didn't say, let's just all go up so they can all see this and they can all see what God can do. But he says, stay here. Here it is. Because in worship, sometimes we allow people or stuff to take us away from the experience we have with God. And so he says, you stay here. Because even right now in this room, some of us will not be so open to worship because we're allowing other people to rob us from our connection with God. And sometimes it's not a person, but sometimes it's stuff. Hence the donkey. Some of us are not our best worshipers, listen to me, because we're worried about how we're going to look. We're worried about how we're going to sound. We're worried about who's watching us and what they'll say after service. But I want to remind you on this afternoon that whenever we come into this place of worship, it's all about the audience of one. You know what I realize in life is that in moments where you are challenged or you're in trouble, the real you shows up. Matter of fact, if I can be fully honest with you, Mrs. Johnson, you know this already, but every now and then things talk to me and I talk back to it. I promise you, full transparency, I'm not crazy. 
Um, and for us biblical preachers, we call this the theophany of God. Theos, God, ophany, something. So something is in, uh, 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 or something is talking to me, and I'm talking back to it. And so let me just get to the point. Every now and then I enjoy drinking a little ginger tea. By the sounds of it, no one else drinks ginger tea. <laughs> Amen. But I enjoy ginger tea. I like ginger tea in the tea bag. And so on this particular day, I was about to uh, drink some ginger tea. And I'll never forget, I put the hot water uh, on the kettle and I poured it into the cup. And I was about to get my ginger tea bag and drop it in there. And the ginger tea bag said to me, Marvin. And I said, yes. And he said, don't put me in just yet. And so I said, okay. He said, I want you to realize something is about to happen. And I, I said, I understand that. He says, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to put you in the cup. And after I put you in the cup, I'm then going to stir you and then I'm going to drink you. And he said, well, I want you to understand because I need you to tell somebody that in life, what happens is whatever's inside of me comes outside of me in a hot water situation. And so he said, I need you to preach and teach so someone will understand that it's very important, it's vital, it's essential, it's imperative that you understand that whatever's in you in a hot water situation, troubles, trials, disappointment, arguments, whatever's in you will come out of you because we call that reverse osmosis. And some of us in this room can testify that when you're in a hot water situation, the best version of you does not come out of you. You look great on Sabbath morning. You, you sound great in the classroom. But when trouble comes your way, the most nastiest, evil, unchristlike spirit comes out of us. And at this situation, Abraham refuses to allow the wrong Abraham to come out. And the word says he goes against everything he's feeling. The Bible says in verse 5, I want you to catch this thing, please. We're going to shut this down very soon. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We'll worship and then we'll come back to you. Verse 6 it opens our eyes when he says, and he makes it clear, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them went on together. Verse 7 tells us, Isaac spoke up, God bless him, and said to his father, Father? Verse 8. Yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire, the wood are here. Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I would have given that student an A. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Before we go to verse 9, I want to just put a quick plug. We'll call this a commercial break right here. I think this is a very powerful lesson for parents. I want you to notice that Abraham really did not have an answer. And sometimes as Christians, we're really good at creating answers that we know are not necessarily true. The Bible says, he's very clear. He says, I see this, I see this. Dad, uh, normally in the past, we've done this before. And when we did this before, I noticed you had the lamb, but today you don't have the lamb. And if you're doing the sacrifice, who's going to be the one being sacrificed? Marvin Clark's version. And I really believe deep down inside. Isaac was really walking by faith. And I believe in this moment, Isaac is saying, even when it doesn't make sense, I'm going to trust my father because he's never failed me yet. And I need some of us to know in this Black History Month, despite all that we've gone through, because listen to me, black people have gone through a lot. Suffering, pain, death. But we can't stay there. We can't stay there. We got to walk, live, function, move by faith. 
we got to believe that the God who has led us in that tough past is still the God that can lead us in our present. I want to show you something before we close this thing. Watch this. The Bible says when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am, he replied. Verse 12 says, do not lay your hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Listen to me. When it comes to this journey of Christianity or when it comes to entertaining the idea of being rooted, it is very important to understand that there is sacrifice every time you entertain worship. Every time you come into this place, every time you go on your knees, every time you seek God, every time you're in the classroom and your teacher says, it's time to pray, it's time to have worship, I want you to know there has to be, there has to be a moment of sacrifice because that's a part of worship. So that means sometimes you sacrifice your time, you sacrifice your energy, you sacrifice your mind, you sacrifice certain things, but there has to be sacrifice. And when God sees that you sacrifice for him, he will make sure he brings about whatever healing, blessing, whatever you need, God will show up. But you got to prove that you understand the power of worship. Sometimes we like to worship too comfortably. Sometimes our air conditioning is blowing just too good. Sometimes our pews are just too comfortable. The recline of the pew is just right where you can lean back and get the right snore. Not in this church, bless the name of the Lord, but maybe in another church. This is a good opportunity to nudge your neighbor. Wake up, he's talking about you. Anyways. The Bible says, do not lay a hand on the boy because now we know that you fear God. Let me suggest to someone today, a part of being rooted is fearing God. A part of understanding where you come from and your heritage, not just culturally, but really from the genesis of it all in Adam, it's fearing the one who called you into existence. And if you're rooted in that space and sense, then there has to be some homage and respect and acknowledgement to God and so Abraham has a choice to make either I slay my son because that's what God told me to do or I selfishly do what I want to do but because he understands watch this don't miss this thing please that any blessing from God is residually felt he understands that even in failing to himself He'll always be providing a blessing, if not for him, but for someone else that's coming behind him. In other words, when you follow God's objective and desire for your life, sometimes you may not see the blessing now, but your children will see it later. And I hope somebody in church today can say amen to that. Watch this, verse 13. The Bible says, verse 13. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a really good story, and it's just like, oh, wow, bless the Lord. He showed up. He did something for Abraham. That's great. But as I was looking at this pastor, I I, I was a little bit troubled because I, I started to ask myself, What did that look like when Abraham was going up the mountain? Because that mountain Moriah, if I can just illustrate it for just the next couple of minutes, I can imagine Abraham going up the mountain. And if you notice, the text says he looked up and saw the ram behind him in the thicket. And I asked myself the question, if if he saw the ram behind him, that means he must have passed it on his way going up. 
Because if you look in the original language, it suggests that it was behind him and not just when he looked up, he saw it, which means on his way up, he must have passed it. So I asked the question, does that mean that God will bless you even though you passed a certain area, age, stage, situation in life, that the Lord will somehow bring back whatever you need if you're obedient? In other words, you do your part and let God do his part. In other words, let me be the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, and you be the child of the most high king. In other words, just be rooted in me, be obedient to me, listen to me, follow me, and I'll give you all the desires of your heart the bible makes it clear he looked behind him and saw the ram watch this caught in the thicket now full disclosure i must be honest with you that i i i am a caribbean background gentleman and I've been very privileged to, uh, coming from the island of Jamaica, I, I've seen a ram in my lifetime. And I must tell you today that rams use their horns to fight you off. Matter of fact, if you come too close to a ram, he will use his horns to let you know you're too close to me. And I couldn't help but to ask myself the question, Marvin, yes, uh, if, 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 if Abraham saw this ram caught in the thicket and it was caught by its horns, that would suggest that God perfectly wrapped the ram using the thicket, not around his feet, not around his body, but around his horns. Because God knew that if Abraham walked over to that ram the ram would cause harm to Abraham and so God is saying if you're just obedient with me if you're just rooted in me I will wrap a present just for you let me put it another way there's some gifts and blessings that don't want to be your gift and blessing but the God we serve will perfectly wrap that situation and present it to you so what should have harmed you or hurt you will be sitting right there for you and I know in this room we can testify that there's some things that you didn't do but you just walked into that blessing let me talk to the students over here you went to school one day you know you were supposed to have a test that day but your teacher found grace and mercy and said I'll give you one more day to study somebody ought to say amen I know that students know what I'm talking about when you know you didn't do all that you should have did on that project help me Holy Ghost but the Lord made a way through your teacher to give you that B when you shouldn't got a D I thought you'd say amen right there. I'm trying to testify to someone in this room that when you're rooted for Christ, Christ will take care of you. So this afternoon, the Bible's very clear. Abraham understood the value of trusting God and allowing not what he sees to compel him to do what he wants to do but to be compelled by the Holy Spirit. It broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. You'll notice that this preacher has to wear glasses because I can't always see what I want to see. Matter of fact, I'm looking at you wondering if you notice that I can't really see you. <laughs> but on this particular day, I, I went to my doctor to address my eyes because I had not been in his office for some years. And he said something to me that really spoke volumes to me that I think is necessary to share with you as we bring this to a close. He said to me, Pastor, you haven't been here for a while. I said, yes, that's, that's true. He said, matter of fact, when was the last time you were here? And I told him, well, last time I was here is probably 2016. And so he said, you mean to tell me that you're coming to me in 2020 and the last time you were here was 2016? I said, that's correct. He said, in other words, you're walking into 2020 with 2016 vision. <laughs> and I said, that's correct. He said, Pastor, how do you expect your church to walk into 2020 
with 2016 vision. He said, you know what that means? I said, Doc, preach. He said, I'm about to. He said, that means that you're really not seeing what you're supposed to see. He said, that means you're not adjusting to the changes and transformations that have taken place around you. That means you're using old school stuff to address new school issues. Your success will always be limited. My encouragement to us today is that we don't get caught up so much in our past that we don't see Christ in our future. God is knocking on our doors even today, asking us to get uncomfortable to be comfortable, to shift your views, how you deal with people, how you communicate, how you show, here it is, that Christ-like love. Not only when you feel like it, not only when it's someone that you're familiar with, but with people who need to know the God you serve. This afternoon, I'm looking for a simple appeal. I want someone today to say, Pastor, I believe that I have not been accessing faith like I should. And today, I want to stand up and I want to secure that from this day onward, I'm going to be exercising my faith a little bit more. What that means is I'm going to start trusting God even when it feels like I don't see him. I'm going to start believing in God's word even when it goes against popular opinion. Listen to me, students. I'm going to start trusting not what I see on IG or TikTok or any social media platform, but I'm going to trust what the Bible says. I'm not going to allow what I see on social media to pretty much define me whether or not I'm cute. Listen to me, ladies. I'm not going to be so caught up in makeup trying to contour my face so that I can look cute. But I'm going to believe what the Bible says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm going to ask our young men to not think that you can't be emotional and acknowledge that you're struggling or you're feeling doubt in who you are and where you are. I need us to be honest with where we are with Christ so Christ can say, listen, stay rooted in me so I can transform you, so I can make a better version of you because I'm telling you where you are right now is not enough. I need you to be a better version of yourself because someone else needs to know that you are valuable, that you are in this place for a reason, that there's purpose on your life, that the best for you is on its way if you're rooted in him. Not in what you feel, not popular opinion, not what looks like it's cool, but in him. So this afternoon, I'm looking for some bold people to stand up right now and say, Pastor, I'm going to join you up front because I need to exercise my faith a little bit more. Who's coming? Who's stepping forward? Who's going to be bold this afternoon and say, I'm following God's will because I don't want to stay where I am. I need to be a better version of myself. I need to exercise my faith a little bit more. I need to trust God when I wake up in the morning. I need to stop believing the negativity that's around me. Who's going to stand today and join this preacher up here? Who's coming? Who's coming? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Let me tell you why it's bowed and it's closed. Because you're praying. If you're not praying for yourself, you're praying for someone else. Because I know in this room right now, something that we do very well, listen to me, we do this very well, we suffer in silence. We're very good at acting the part. And let me tell you what I've, what I've learned over the 24 years of ministry in my life. Let me tell you what I've learned. I have learned, unfortunately, that we have copied what we've seen. So we've seen some of our parents preach, Pastor, I'm trying to. We've seen some of our eldest siblings act the part of Christianity, suffering in silence, not bold enough to say, this is where I'm struggling, this is where I'm hurt, this is where I'm feeling pain. We don't acknowledge that. We would rather just look the part even though we're dying inside. 
And so we ask ourselves, why is it that our young people don't want to share? Why is it they don't want to express that I'm going through a tough time? The reason why they don't want to express is because they've learned it from you. And so this afternoon, as much as that hurts, I think it's important that we're honest with ourselves. I have to be honest with myself. Listen to me clearly. I have to be honest with my mother. I have to tell her, Mom, listen, you are an amazing mom. You are wonderfully and fearfully made. You have supported us as children. But guess what? You are not honest with where you are in life. You're struggling. You're sad. You're tired. You're weak. Why don't you just say, I need some support so that that would augment how we act as your children because sometimes we don't do better because we don't know better. So instead of you thinking you're saving us, Release us to admit and acknowledge the truth that everyone struggles. Everyone gets broken. Everyone needs crisis power. Everyone needs to be encouraged. Everyone needs to be valued. Everyone needs to be honored. And everyone needs to be celebrated. So this afternoon talking to the parents now if you're not up here and I respect you parents that are up here right now God bless you parents but if you're not up here and you're a parent and you know I'm talking to you that you need to access that faith a little bit more access it on the job access it maybe with your health that you're looking for some healing there was a doctor's diagnosis but we all know and claim that Dr. Jesus has the last word. If you're here this afternoon, I want you to stand on your feet. If I'm talking to you, I need to access that faith a little more. If you're here this afternoon, you're a parent, you're in the pews. I want you to stand on your two good feet. God bless you. And ask God to do something in your life, around your life. Rooted in faith. Rooted in faith. Young people, I've been doing this thing for a long while, my perspective. For these 20 some odd years, I've had to do many things that I did not want to do. Funerals for promising young people. Pray over surgeries for promising young people. I looked at some students as a chaplain one week and over the summer break they did not make it back to school because we don't know what tomorrow may bring I'm encouraging you on this afternoon please be rooted in Christ please exercise your faith to trust not what feels good but what is good under the standards of God's word. Please spend time in prayer. Please surround yourself with company that is like-minded. <laughs> Ten years ago, someone that is not a spiritual person in terms of being an Adventist or a Christian told me these words he said to me his influence and power of success in Hollywood is merely because of who he's associated with he said he gets into the right room and because he's in the right room success comes his way that person is Will Smith but you know what I've learned as much as success that Will Smith may say he has, is that his success is limited. When he shared that with me in my spirit, I said, yeah, you'll, you'll own all the cars you want. You'll live in the house that you desire. But then what? You see this thing called Christianity, this thing called following God, this thing called being rooted and walking by faith. This tells us that our success, our true success, will be in glory. And some of us, keeping it honest, 
We'll get a glimpse of it down here, but there's no comparison to when we get with Jesus Christ. So I'm encouraging you today, please stay faithful, stay obedient, and be rooted in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we pause. We pause first with thanksgiving. Lord, as I look in this room and I see those that are standing, I know you're standing with them. I know your angels are surrounding this place. I know that your spirit is falling afresh on every mind. I pray, Lord, you'll be with our young people's frontal lobes as they deal with the reasoning of life. I pray, Lord, that you will even now begin to address and adjust the hypothalamus of their emotion that causes them to get excited over things without reasoning. I pray, Lord, that you'll order each step that they make in each conversation that they'll have in each discussion and in each interchangeable dialogue that they'll have with someone that father you'll show them that you're trying to guide them on a better path I pray Lord for a young person in here right now that's going through a tough situation they know their circumstance they they know the trial they know the issue I pray Lord just like Abraham that they will not not fall to what they want to do but they'll trust you and that Lord when you lead them to that mountain you'll show up like you did for Abraham and you'll say don't touch him don't don't go there don't say that I now know you fear me so I'm going to rescue you from where you are I pray Lord that this day will be a turnaround day for somebody that they'll trust you like they've never trusted you before we celebrate the parents and those that are standing in the pews. I pray, oh God, that you'll continue to watch over them and trust them, Lord, that even on this day that you're going to open up some doors that no man can shut. That, Father, you're going to heal some bodies. You're going to feel, you're going to bring some redemption and power in their lives that they've never had before. And, Lord, we trust you in this journey because we want to be rooted in you. And now, Lord, because we know that you're able, dependable, and assurable, we leave everything into your care. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do and how your power will rescue us, all of us as mankind, in this month of black history. In Jesus' precious and powerful name, let all of God's people say amen and amen again. Can we put our hands together for the spirit in here today? Can we celebrate these bold individuals that walk by faith? I believe right now that angels are standing around each and every one of them. And by God's grace, we'll keep keeping on and the best is yet to come for their future. God bless you, church. And may the Lord continue to watch between you and I. God bless you. Sabbath Church, please close your eyes and bow your heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for gathering us here together in church today. Please help us to remember that we are rooted in you. And um, please help us to remember that the, the faith that um, Abraham had. We love you, Lord. Talk to you soon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.